Hi everyone, happy World Consumer Rights Day. So this is the third session of our energy conference and today we're going to be focusing on our consumer vision for clean and affordable energy. So firstly, just some house rules. If you can, please remain on mute when you aren't speaking so that everyone can hear our panellists. And in between discussions, you can use the chat function if you have any thoughts, comments and questions, and you can also use the Q&A function. Um, so we do have interpretation available for this webinar in Spanish and French. So to access that, you just have to click the little interpretation button that's circled at the bottom of this slide um, and choose your speaking language. And if you have any issues with that, um, just pop it in the chat and we'll be able to help. We do also have closed captions available. So similarly to interpretation, it's circled here at the bottom with show captions and um, choose your speaking language. So I'm going to pass over to Gilly, who is our moderator for today's session. Thank you so much. Um, today is a very important day for every consumers in the world because today is the World Consumer Rights Day. And uh, every day, um, uh, uh, each year um, today, the consumer movement unites together to highlight a pressing issue facing consumers globally. And this year, the members of uh, Consumers International, we are talking about 200 consumer groups in 100 countries, select empowering consumers through clean energy transitions as our global theme. Amidst the greatest cost of living crisis uh, in a generation and as the energy world uh, drastically responds to supply and climate issues, we need more than ever to deliver a just transition for consumers. So just against this backdrop, we are delighted to be welcoming a very brilliant panel of leaders from the energy and consumer worlds. So to start with, we have Katri Simpson, um, our European Commissioner for Energy. And please, you know, give me a round of applause, you know, to have her here because out of her very busy schedule, uh, she joined us today uh, for this uh, important session. Please join me for a, a clip of uh, hands, you know, for that. Thank you so much. And uh, just to introduce, um, uh, Commissioner Simpson, um, she is an Estonia polit politician from the Central Party who has been serving as a European Commissioner for Energy in the von der Leyen Commission since December 2019. She was previously the Minister of Economic Affairs and Infrastructure in Yuri Rata's first cabinet from 2016 to 2019. During the Estonia presidency in the Council of the EU, Simpson chaired both energy uh, ministers and transport ministers meeting in Transport, Telecommunications and Energy Council and ministers of economic format in EU Competitiveness Council. So we are really delighted to have her on the panel as one of the world's foremost leader charting a path through the energy crisis with and for European consumers and citizens. Our second distinct speaker is Angela Wilkinson, the Secretary General and CEO of World Energy Council. She is the sixth Secretary General of the World Energy Council, a diverse community network of over 3,000 members organizations that has been instrumental in promoting better energy developments in over 100 countries for nearly 100 years. She has over 30 years of experience in leading national, international, and global multi-stakeholder transformation initiatives on a wide range of economic, energy, climate, and sustainable development-related challenges, and has previously held senior executive roles in the public, private, academic, and civil sectors. She is also an Oxford scholar and also published author. So uh, welcome, uh, Angela. We look forward to hearing you from uh, your depth of exper uh, expertise on how clean and also just energy transitions can be brought down um, at the human level and truly serve the needs of diverse consumers and communities. Our third distinct speaker is Katie Gurasa, Vice President, Corporate Affairs, the Electric Power Research Institute. So in her role as um, uh, Vice President, Corporate Affairs, uh, Katie provides executive direction and leadership for the organization external stakeholder relationships and for communication in support of member engagement, marketing, media relations, and technical products. She brings to the organization more than 25 years in the energy, water, and manufacturing industries and in the public sector. 
Most recently, she led the U.S. Department of Energy Policy and Technology team responsible for trans <clears throat> transmission permitting and technical assistance in the department's Office of Electricity. She also served as a key leader in expanding and diversifying the Office Electricity Advisory Council with responsibility for aligning research with clear benefits to the public. Katie's unique and valuable contribution to this panel will come from her depth of expertise, experience across the industry government research in the energy sector. Welcome, uh, Katie. We look forward to hear from you. And our fourth speaker is Suraja. Sandaram, Executive Director of Citizen Consumer and Civic Action Group from India. Um, it is in Tamil Nadu, India. It's a non-profit, non-profit making, non-political, professional organization working towards protecting citizens' rights in consumer and environmental issues and promoting good governance, including transparency, accountability, and participatory decision making. As the Executive Director, Suroja leads projects on various consumer issues, counsel consumers on consumer complaints, and engages with relevant public agencies and civil society groups to address gaps in policies and practices. We look forward to hearing from Suroja on the diverse and powerful work they are leading to map decarbonization pathways in Tamil Nadu, empower vulnerable communities to have a say over new coal plants, promote citizen science and monitoring, and much more. We look forward to hear from you, Saroja. And our next speaker is Sari, Sari Adam Somwing. Um, she is the Secretary General of the Foundation for Consumers, Thailand. She is very experienced and a seasoned advocate who was instrumental in building up the consumer movement in Thailand. She worked with the Coordinating Committee for Primary Health Care of Thai NGOs before proposing the formation of the Foundation for Consumers in 1994. Uh, we are talking about 30 years ago, to work directly with people as well as policymakers for the protection of consumer rights. She currently manages the organization from the office in Bangkok. The foundation is now the main leading consumer organization in Thailand. It also helped to set up the Confederation of Consumer Organizations, a non-governmental and non-profit making network organization comprised of 17 consumer organizations and groups around the country working on issues related to health, gender, agriculture, labor rights. So uh, we look forward to hear from Suri as well. And a final speaker is going to join us later is Stefan Loren Lorenas, President, Organization of Consumer and Users of Chile. Stefan has overseen the Organization of Consumers and Users of Chile since 2015. As president of the organization, he has have he has had active participation in the different public policies of his country, such as the recent implementation of the new country law. He was notably part of the negotiation table with a tissue paper manufacturing company that achieved a high level of compensation for all citizens of Chile. Stefan was also part of the Consumers International in Santiago between 1995 and 2015, so a strong supporter of CI and was responsible for the environmental and consumption program. So when um, Stefan joined us, we also look forward to hearing from him also. Okay, let's uh, have a bit of recap about um, the Clean Energy Conference before we pass the time to our distinct speaker, Commissioner Simpson. Um, this week is um, the headline you know, of this session. Um, consumers and users must be at the heart of the energy transition. Not least, uh, because energy is required to meet basic human needs, but current policies, action, and system are rarely centered on consumer and is on his or her needs. CI is holding the first conference of this type to coalesce uh, stakeholders around this new global action agenda. So on Monday, we heard how consumer protection can act as a catalyst for the energy transition, building trust and confidence in new solutions. On yesterday, Tuesday, we heard from business how they are innovating to create new market offers and consumer engagement models that bring benefit to both people and planet. So this session, our consumer vision for clean and affordable energy, will look at how to secure both sustainability and affordability for energy consumers worldwide and at a very highly strategic level. So a few words on the session topic. 
the event of 2022 was a forceful reminder of the difficulty of ensuring affordability and security in the transition to clean energy. Last year, probably everyone encountered is the global energy prices were estimated to rise by an average of 50% by the AN, impacting people everywhere and causing many to drastically change their lifestyle to pay for energy. Um, in 2022, CI members shared the extent of rising prices for consumer with over 20% reporting that the price increase of more than 100%. So that is quite um, a big impact to, um, to the affected consumers. Consumers find themselves in the eye of the storm, picking up the bill for skyrocketing fossil fuel prices. So today's challenge is to help consumers through presenting through these present difficulties while enabling a rapid transition that guarantees sustainability, security, and affordability in the long run. So without further ado, with all this background, we would like to hear from our distinct speaker, Commissioner Simpson, who will give us a high-level statement on accelerating joint European action for more affordable and sustainable energy. May I pass the time to our distinct speaker, Commissioner Simpson. Thank you so much and uh, greetings from Brussels. Um, on today's uh, World Consumer Rights Day, it's my pleasure to open uh, this session um, on clean and affordable energy. And let me first congratulate Consumers International for the white paper on consumer protection and uh, empowerment for a clean energy future, because your recommendations, uh, they are a valuable contribution and they underpin the decisive actions um, the union has taken to further empower consumers and ensure our clean energy transition is accessible to all. And last year, this was an extraordinary year, um, difficult for our consumers, um, both here in Europe, but also globally. Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine brought the horror of war to Europe, and it triggered the truly global energy crisis. Of course, Europe was at the center of this crisis, and European consumers um, really suffered in many ways. Consumers were hit by rising prices, of course. Um, this affected their cost of living. They were also exposed to security of supply risks, and some of them were victims of unfair commercial practices. So let me mention all these three dimensions. In the crisis, for the first time, the prospect of not being able to pay the next energy bill became a reality for a much broader number of Europeans beyond the millions who already experienced energy poverty. Um, such a challenge required a strong policy response and the EU responded quickly and decisively. This started already in October 2021, but now feels like a lifetime ago with a toolbox of measures for member states to take um, to limit the price increases and protect uh, vulnerable households and also small medium businesses. And the economic think tank Bruegel estimates that European member states allocated more than 657 billion euros to shield consumers from rising energy costs since autumn 2021. And on top of this, last year in September, we presented measures for limiting the revenue of inframarginal electricity generation and this revenue was channeled back as surplus revenues to support um, and finance the, then support measures for consumers. And we also proposed measures to reduce electricity demand, especially during price peak hours and the solidarity contribution from, uh, from fossil fuel uh, industry. And in October and December, we, we intervened in the gas market to enhance gas solidarity and introduce a price correction mechanism. And now we can say that as prices are going down, we are now moving towards structural solutions. And just yesterday, I presented the reform of electricity market design. And I'm glad to see that um, the recommendations in your white paper are mostly aligned with our main objective to curb consumers' exposure to volatile short-term prices. Our aim is to ensure consumers benefit from price stability, and lower prices coming from renewables and long-term contracts. And we also want to give consumers more options for directly accessing um, renewable energy, for example, through renewable energy sharing schemes. But in this crisis, consumers also faced uh, the risk of security of supply, as Europe was forced to disengage from our largest and now we know unreliable supplier, Russia. So 
power repower EU agenda has led to a fundamental and I can say also unprecedented shift in our energy system. So in one year, we have reduced our dependency on Russian fossil fuels. Um, we also imposed sanctions on coal and oil. And last year we replaced in power generation large share of Russian gas with renewables, additional 50 gigawatts. Um, so electricity generation from wind and solar PV exceeded that of gas and nuclear in Europe last year. And that meant that we cut our CO2 emissions by two and a half percentage. And looking back, it is clear that uh, EU policy efforts have paid off. Uh, here again, we are now moving from emergency to medium term responses um, to energy efficiency and renewables. And, and EU Save Energy Communication from last May already promoted immediate energy savings by citizens and businesses. And just last week, we reached a provisional agreement to reform and strengthen the EU Energy Efficiency Directive. So this is a political agreement that includes very ambitious energy efficiency targets for 2030, and it strengthens provisions on energy efficiency financing to ramp up much needed investment. And, and there we do have first ever EU definition of energy poverty. This is significant because uh, there is no, uh, there is now a, a stronger focus on those most affected by energy poverty and especially vulnerable customers. But of course, again, low income households. And finally, the energy crisis has also exposed um, um, a real issue with consumer rights and protection in Europe. Uh, consumer organizations reported examples where suppliers switch consumers from fixed price contracts without adequate information, or they announced significant price increases on page two of a letter with energy tips, um, so hidden information, um, they unilaterally terminated open-ended contracts or did not advertise the full price that customers uh, were forced to pay. So we have seen also that uh, some suppliers went bankrupt uh, because they were not hedging their sales and uh, that meant that uh, thousands of customers were left stranded. That's why we have made consumer protection um, a key pillar of our reform of the electricity market design. We propose to allow customers to have more than one meter and different contracts to serve their, for example, their electric vehicle or heat pumps or domestic consumption um, using different contracts. And we introduce a right to energy sharing. This is important for prosumers. And we clarify that consumers should be offered a variety of contracts fitting their needs. Um, also, not only dynamic contracts, but if they want to do so, also a fixed price contracts. And we require suppliers to hedge a part of their sales to avoid in the future crisis um, bankruptcy issues that were seen last year. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I can say that since the energy crisis started, we here in Europe, we have witnessed tremendous transformation of our energy system. It happened so fast um, and it is made possible thanks to European consumers. They are, are the ones who are installing solar PVs on their roofs, putting heat pumps in their homes, adjusting their lifestyles and to reduce energy consumption. And um, Europe will continue working for them as we strive to make our energy system even more affordable, secure and clean. Thank you very much for listening and uh, I wish you a very fruitful uh, panel and, uh, and uh, interesting conference. Thank you so much, Commissioner Simsa. It is a very encouraging and also forward-looking um, uh, remark to all of us. And I hope, you know, with a collective effort that uh, everyone can have a cheaper and more affordable energy uh, in the near future, very soon, you know, with the support, you know, from all the governments and our own action as well. Thank you so much for that. And uh, since we have uh, such a brilliant uh, uh, panel here, probably, you know, we should invite everyone to give a quick reaction to what uh, communication have just said and to share your initial thoughts, you know, on the theme. So um, we keep it short and crispy as a warm up. So may I invite uh, our speaker to, uh, to share your immediate response uh, in one minute. How about Angela, you start first. Well, there was an awful lot covered in by Commissioner Simpson, so I won't cover all of it. I'd just like to say, if we went back a couple of years, we'd all have been talking about the climate emergency and the need to think about 
decarbonizing the, the energy systems as quickly as possible and the role of consumers in that. And then we had the invasion of Ukraine and the attention focused on security again. And now we're in the middle of this, um, this cost of living crisis and our attention's on affordability. And what that brings us back to is we have to manage the energy trilemma of security and affordability and environmental sustainability as we try and develop our energy systems in faster, fairer, and more fundamentally different ways. So I'm going to I'm going to talk about the world energy trilemma as an enabling framework that governments, businesses, and consumers can use to help them understand how they're making progress on this journey. And let's remember that we're on a journey not just to decarbonize our energy system. Paris isn't the destination. What we're on is a journey to secure a safe operating space for 10 billion better lives on one healthy planet. And that we haven't even started that journey. We're just in the early years. And what we're finding is that we're swinging from one crisis to another as we try and move forward. So we have to find a way of bringing more people. World Energy Council and Consumers International have a big focus on people. And that's really good because there's a lot of optimism about technology, but there's a complete blind spot on the role of consumers and people. It's really encouraging to see this white paper coming forward. So my, my pieces are, the first enabler is stop people being the blind spot. It's not all about technology and money. It's really about changes and behaviors, uses and users, and how we can make more energy, energy more useful and less wasteful. And then let's get to understand that we can't manage one thing at a time. We have to balance energy security, affordability, and environmental sustainability at all levels of society, and consumers can play a role in that. We've been working with a framework for 20 years to enable them to do that, and we'd like to see it go mainstream. Thank you so much, Angela, for your very precise uh, uh, remark. Uh, how about Saruja? You are from Consumer Protection Agency in India. So what do you think about uh, uh, how does a clean and affordable energy future look like, you know, for consumers in your place? I completely agree. Thank you, uh, Gilly. I completely agree with what the earlier speakers had mentioned. I think uh, uh, balancing the three dimensions of affordability, sustainability, and security is becoming increasingly critical in this decade. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, government policies and incentives will be key to driving the transition towards a more sustainable energy mix. For instance, governments can incentivize the uptake of renewable energy such as wind and solar, reduce energy demand and create energy efficiency standards. By doing so, it will help in, uh, to reduce energy costs for households and businesses while simultaneously reducing emissions. At the same time, it is essential to ensure that the energy transition is affordable and sustainable in long term. To do this, governments need to invest in uh, energy storage technologies, such as batteries and fuel cells, to enable the use of renewable, renewable energy sources and a more reliable energy supply. Additionally, energy costs need to be kept in check. So governments can do this by investing in energy efficiency measures and regulating energy prices to ensure that they remain affordable for households and businesses. Overall, the link between affordability and sustainability is becoming increasingly ingrained in the present uh, energy landscape. So uh, cost-effective, uh, secure, and sustainable energy sources must be identified and developed to ensure a safe, secure, and affordable energy future. Yeah. OK, Saroja, I, I saw Commissioner Simpson has left us uh, because she has a very busy schedule. and. Um, and Chef uh, already left this uh, soon, but we will continue our conversation, obviously. Uh, how about Katie? After hearing um, uh, what uh, Commissioner Simpson has said, what, what, what do you think? Uh, so From yes, I think that, um, and first I'd like to just thank you for having me here today and being on the Sistine panel. I think the commissioner's remarks were just so incredibly pointed on the fact that we really have to think holistically about the energy transition. It's not just about being clean, it's about being affordable and sustainable. And so when I think about how nations have set these ambitious climate goals, um, they really are trying to get us to rethink on how we make, move, and use energy. 
And we see discussions of macro costs to companies, sectors, and geographies, but cost to consumers can sometimes feel a little bit of an afterthought. Um, there's so many stakeholders that need to understand, and we all come at it from different perspectives. So if we can put the consumer at the center of the conversation, it's really why um, the energy industry exists. It's really to serve the customer. So that's why this Consumer Rights Day is so important, and I'm so glad to be here. And um, so some questions that I have that I just pose when I talk to the different stakeholder groups is, do we really understand the consumer view on what is affordable? You know, what do consumers think is sustainable? And depending where you are and what resources you have, it can differ. Um, and when I think of the energy industry, we can define the price of industry, of energy. We can set a rate to dollars or pounds per kilowatt per hour. We can estimate how much it will cost to bring a new generation source online. But defining affordability to local communities requires their input. Questions are, what are they able to pay? What are they willing to pay for? What are the risks they face? How much risk are they willing to take? And so I think of, as we go into this transition, there's a big push for electrification. But how can a consumer even think about owning a vehicle when they don't even have one in the first place? Maybe they ride a bus or they're, you know, and they're in an urban area. And then when we think about resilience, can the community afford to pay, say, for robust infrastructure, say concrete poles today in the event that a hurricane might happen tomorrow? Or will they put in wood poles and then have to pay even more when the time comes? And not to mention all the um, health risks and things that happen when the power goes out. So the issues are very complex. And when I think of how do we secure both affordability and sustainability, let's think more holistically about the different factors. And there's been a lot of great conversation on decarbonization, but also adding those factors and goals of affordability, security, and sustainability are going to be very important in order for us to get there. So thank you. I'll turn it back to you, Gilly. Great. Thank you, Katie. I'm sure we'll have a very um interesting uh, dialogue and discussion afterwards. Um, before we move into the dialogue, probably we should hear also from Suri as well. Suri from Thailand. Uh, what do you think uh, after hearing what uh, Commission said? And also what does the clean and affordable energy future look like for Thailand, for Thai consumers? Oh, you are, you are on mute. Can you, can you unmute? Okay, thank you. Elise and uh, uh, happy well, consumer right there to everyone. Uh, I think in the situation in Thailand right now is uh, especially on energy pricing is increasingly uh, very uh, significant and it's, it will be gone up uh, uh, highly for consumer. And, and it's, it's really uh, difficult, you know, it, it's like uh, we didn't have the sovereignty to uh, to produce our own green energy because it's a lot of obstacles and and uh, a problem if you would like to to do uh, uh, solar energy in your own rooftop something it's it very difficult and the government have a very very small project only ten megawatt. Uh, for for the whole country and limited the uh, uh, power plants on that uh, scheme, and but very lucky for Thailand and uh, right now that we're going to have general election and I hope that this uh, general election will drive uh, uh, forward to increasingly uh, the uh, green energy here in Thailand. Like right now that. Uh, uh, Thailand Consumer Council as a coordinating body for consumer organization uh, proposed to all party here that a uh, million of uh, solar rooftop, million, uh, million of your own rooftop, million solar cells. And this is uh, a big campaign will be happened uh, through the whole year here in Thailand. And I hope that your recommendation, Kathy, will be also, we will look at the a possibility how we can bring the 
uh, challenge and opportunity to uh, implement here in Thailand also, since we got difficulty to uh, implement because it's obstacle from the condition from uh, like, you know, for, for clean energy in solar cell itself, they would say about uh, dark curve, you might heard about that, but it's not uh, really true for the society, but it's still a big obstacle for the Thai consumer to do so on uh, solar cell at their own uh, house on rooftops or something. Thank you, Gilly. Thank you, Suri. Okay, we finished the warm up by responding to what commissioner has said. Now we have to drill into something deeper and much harder as question. Um, we talk about uh, sustainability, security, and also affordability. We talk about, you know, we should maintain the balance um, of it uh, because, you know, there may be some trade-off. But in reality, when you try to maintain that kind of balance, that requires of lots of technique and, um, and also um, it, it's like a trilemma, frankly speaking. So facing this trilemma, uh, especially on affordability and also sustainability, because Usually, when we talk about sustainability, it incurs higher costs, you know, for the uh, uh, for the development. But on the other hand, we try to make it as low cost as possible for the consumers. So, how do you see this trilemma on this energy trilemma, and uh, what can we do, you know, uh, beyond? Uh, probably, I should kick off with Angela first. Angela, so you are uh, an expert on this. So, with the current uh, uh, turmoil in uh, energy. So how do you see this uh, energy trilemma and also uh, what, what is the priority, you know, in your view right now? Thank you. So we, we introduced the World Energy Trilemma Framework 15 years ago, and we track and measure progress of countries in managing energy security, affordability and equity and environmental sustainability. Um, on a national basis. And we're, we, we have to bear in mind that the trilemma evolves as we go through energy transition, as we move and shift technologies from fossil fuels and nuclear to increasingly amounts of renewable energy in the mix. The trilemma itself is evolving. And I, I, want, I want to pick up on Katie's point. What a government thinks about in terms of security and affordability and sustainability and what they measure can be different from the metrics you have to use when you're dealing with the consumer, what a consumer can do and the choices they have about affordability and sustainability and um, security or reliability, a consumer would say that. So what we need is we have to have a more flexible trilemma. We have to have metrics that work at the government level. We have to have metrics that work at a city level and we have to have metrics that work at the consumer level. And if I just pick up on each of these boxes is not simple. If I just take affordability, we talk an awful lot about the prices of technologies. The cost of renewables is coming down. So everybody's expecting the price of energy to get cheaper. But affordability is a different thing. Affordability is about the value in use of energy. What value do you get from using it? So even if you're given the cheapest, greenest solar mini grid or wind grid, if you're using your energy for something which isn't generating more value, you can't afford to keep paying for the system. So you've got to think of the connection between the cost of technology, the cost to run the whole system, because very few of us generate energy and use it in the same place, right? There's a system, a connection, and what value the consumer is getting that means that they can sustain the payment for that service. And if you go into each of those boxes, if you go to environmental sustainability, in some parts of the world, that's about decarbonisation. In other parts of the world, you have to connect food security with energy security and water security because you're having to manage all three things. So we need to be, we have to understand the trilemma is never going to go away, but we need to have a way of operationalising it at government city and consumer level. And that's what we're working on. We've worked on the last one for 20 years. For the next 20, for the next 10 years, we'll be bringing out a new trilemma framework with new metrics. And we hope to work with Consumers International on that. Oh, thank you so much, Angela, for, for, for bringing this up and also working with Consumers International for that. Uh, but when we boil it down to the country level, um, the, the preference of the, of, of the government and also how proactive they are, the policy direction 
will drive a big difference. We'll make a big difference of that. So probably, you know, right now, you know, I want to zoom into the market level with um, uh, with India first. Saruja, what do you think? What, what do you think about the trade-off on this uh, dilemma? I think it's, uh, thank you, Gilly. I think it's going, it's really tricky. But then uh, the governments have to actually uh, come up with policies. I think it is very key for the governments to play an important role in implementing policies and, and incentivizing uh, this transition towards low carbon energy mix, which is also affordable because today affordability is the question when we talk about uh, renewables and uh, sustainability. And therefore, I think uh, to actually arrive at that balance to ensure that uh, uh, we get affordable um, uh, and uh, energy security is also important. So when we look at these three, I think uh, it's, it's more important for governments to come up with this um, uh, more policies and mainly to incentivize the, the drive towards transition um, uh, um, towards this low carbon energy mix, which is very important because that helps uh, in providing households and businesses with an affordable and reliable energy uh, supply. So I, I and the, the Indian government actually has been taking steps on, on towards this and there are, there are several schemes that are being promoted uh, in order to uh, incentivize, but I think we need to come up with more such initiatives and on the uh, consumer side, more awareness on um, the need to shift towards um, uh, renewables, uh, towards more sustainable mold, uh, 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 modes of generation uh, is another uh, thing that needs to happen. Um, but I think we are, uh, uh, we have start, we have initiated the process and it takes time for this to happen. Thank you. Definitely, it will take uh, some time for for the government, you know, to to gradually, you know, take uh, uh, make it, you know, to take shape. How about Suri in Thailand? You briefly mentioned about Thailand uh, when responding um, to the earlier questions, but uh, drill down into the trilemma. How about Thailand? Um, thank you, Kili. I think this uh, very uh, uh, tricky uh, uh, from the government, like. Uh, uh, here, the situation here in Thailand that you have more than security. And then the cost of security is its burdens on consumers, right? Uh, like, you know, let's say that ele electricity, uh, normally we have 15% uh, 15 saving for energy, but right now we found out that it's more than 50% uh, saving energy. And the government is still looking for uh, uh, the new, uh, uh, like the new provider to to make more and more uh, security is a burden to the consumer, especially on elect electricity bill. Uh, like you, and even the regulator cannot do anything because. Uh, 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 the argument is uh, for security, but if more security, then the uh, price will be burdened to the consumer, I think. And mostly, uh, I, I don't know in other country here in Thailand that we have like uh, uh, the uh, uh, power plant development is uh, very close to the stock market. And then uh, the uh, security is more or less uh, dominated by the the market, the the stock market, and then you know uh, more uh, 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 power plants uh, will be uh, dominated in every year. Even right now, that we can we uh, done a camp uh, campaign with many groups uh, to stop uh, buying or doing a concession with the provider but it's still in the process. And, and that is the burden of the consumer, especially in the security issue. And affordable price, I here in Thailand, we have like a, a mechanism helping uh, this advantage group for every month. But uh, we argue that that should be uh, run to the solar rooftop, not only uh, paying the bill instead for the uh, disadvantaged group. and. Uh, this 
uh, argument from the government for security, I think is not true. And the consumer organization have to watch on that and it's a big burden to consumer uh, price. Thank you. Thank you, Suri. You have mentioned about uh, higher security, higher price. So it seems like, you know, this is a, a dilemma that we are facing already. Katie, you are the expert in uh, energy research. Uh, what is your response about it? You know, on the security side, better security, higher price, but all at the cost of consumer. What do you think? Yes, I think that is a very, uh, there, there's two things that are very much opposing forces. I think of the fact that the when um, electric grids are designed, they tend to be designed for efficiency, reliability um, to the consumer. And then when you try to add security to that, well, efficiency is kind of the opposite of that because security means you need additional options, you need redundancy, and you need robustness. So how do you weigh the decisions between efficiency versus security? And so we've done a lot of research in that area and um, we've really found um, that having as many options, as many tools in your toolkit as available, so don't um, leave out certain kinds of resources that are available locally and um, think of all the tools that could be used as well. I mean, we, we, we say optionality is not optional because we have found that it really underpins a reliable, affordable grid. When we shut out options, we found that sometimes you've got to build five times the amount of energy. If, like if you're, if you're considering say a 100% renewable, um, it's, you need to have redundant resources in there when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow, um, or you can have a mix. Um, there's also transmission costs that are in there, and, and there's a lot of um, discussion around um, how do you make that happen if you're, you know, how do the consumers that aren't using that energy, how do they benefit from a transmission line that is going across the country? So um, we're, we're looking at how to make transmission um, uh, less visible because it's um, something that uh, people don't want to see. How can it be more environmentally friendly? How can we make the most of what we already have so we can deliver more electricity through that? So really it's, it's thinking about how can we be more efficient, but also how can we be more secure by adding robust tools into our toolkit? And, um, and when we also think of the cost equation, there's the concept of time. So do you go for the low cost operations that have high capital costs up front, that's very that's a challenge that we're facing today. So how can we change the thinking to think about the life cycle of those energies so that it's not just thinking about cost at the beginning or cost for operations. And so we've, we've got um, much research in that area and um, we're always focused because it's part of our public mission as an independent research institute is to put the public first and find those solutions that are affordable, secure, sustainable, and clean. Yeah, I'll turn it back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Katie. But um, do you think, you know, because, you know, we talk about uh, uh, consumer behavior, you really need to give it a kick, you know, for the other stakeholders like government, you really need to give it a kick. And for Asia, uh, as Asian or Chinese, you know, we always believe when there's a crisis, there will be an opportunity. So do you see this uh, global energy crisis as a turning point in acting as a catalyst in pushing to the clean energy transition. Probably, you know, I skip K to you uh, at the moment, you know, I ask you these questions later on for, for feedback, but I will go to Angela first. Angela, what do you think? Risk uh, crisis versus opportunity. Do you think, you know, it can help to drive it faster than before? I think we're in the middle of um, the world's first um, demand driven energy shocks. And I think like all shocks, there's an opportunity and there's also terrible harm and damage that's done, right? So the world is reeling from this first global demand driven energy shock. That's one of the things that's created the higher prices. It's also come from underinvestment in the systems. Um, and I think that every, every crisis is the moment. We always say never waste the opportunity of a crisis to think about, are we on the right 
are we moving in the right direction? Are we on the right road? Are we doing things in the right way? I actually think we've been, it's been incredible actually that, you know, even going through the COVID crisis, we're still going through the COVID crisis, but in large parts of the world, we no longer talk about it anymore. We're going through an energy crisis, but in some parts of the world, we're not even talking about the energy crisis. And we've got a climate emergency and some people are now saying energy security is more important than climate. So I'm not so sure that the history of humanity is that we actually learn from these crises so much as we we react very quickly to them to try and fix them. But we end up just with sticking plasters rather than lasting solutions. So I'm, I'm in two minds about whether this is this moment is going to be cathartic in terms of of accelerating a what I would call a clean, affordable, reliable and equitable energy transition in all parts of the world, or whether some parts of the world will move faster than others, then this will create bigger divides and gaps. And the World Energy Council has worked for 100 years to manage energy transitions for the common good. And we're concerned. We're concerned that actually we see increasing unevenness and we know that progress is going to be uneven. But we are worried about the unevenness of how countries are managing the trilemma and the gaps and divides that are opening as they do it. And we're seeing a new agenda. We've got a fairness agenda. We're calling it just in this meeting, but in other places they call it inclusive. In other places they call it something else. So we've also got to develop a global language and a set of metrics about what we're measuring here. I was pleased to hear Kadri Simpson, Commissioner Simpson, talking about the European Union has defined energy poverty, but I doubt that definition will work in other regions. So we have to get a global conversation going about what does fairness really mean? How does it relate to affordability? And how does it relate to the clean and inclusive agendas that are there? OK, Katie, what is your response um, to what uh, Angela has response to my questions about opportunity crisis and also opportunity? So what do you think? Well, I, I can see how she can be with two minds because it really is going to just differ around the world. Like, um, uh, I, I do think that there are some areas that will see this as a crisis and uh, certainly um, areas of Europe are experienced it firsthand and, and there's a lot of um, tragedy occurring there. Um, and some will seize it as an opportunity to say, oh, we, we, we must kickstart and go this way. And then others will say, hey, Let's see if this is going to be lasting and do we stay the course? Is just the strategy, the underlying strategy, still a good one with some minor um, tweaks along the way? And I think something that needed to be focused on a little bit more that came out of this, um, um, the, the energy crisis that is occurring in the moment is that uh, the supply chain. And so um, at EPRI, we're, we look to the future and it's great that nations and governments have these ambitious goals, but we think, okay, so how is it going to work 20, 30 years from now? How's it going to work with assets that could be installed that might need to work for 40, 60 years? What are the materials in the, uh, that are going to be needed? Um, if we're going to, um, look at a more electrified future, there's going to be a more materials-based economy than the fuel-based one that we have today. So what is that system gonna look like? The, the, what we produce, how we deliver it, how we use it is going to change in dramatic ways. And so um, has this um, really encouraged a lot more focus on that? I think that it has, because it's a little bit of a wake-up call that yes, we can set ambitious goals, but what's the reality? What are the facts? How's this really going to work? And so I think that's that's probably a um, an outcome that's um, added to the conversation that was desperately needed. Thank you, Katie. When you talk about how you uh, make me um, going to lead into the next question, because no matter how great the policy is, no matter how strategic we are. At the end of the day, we have to deliver. We need to have great programs. We need to have something, you know, to help us to reach, you know, the our our goal. So um, when we talk about energy, we always think about energy efficiency program. We always talk about new technologies. So on that basis, how 
new technology and also energy efficiency can help us in meeting these uh, twin goals. Uh, I want to, you know, have our, uh, our brilliant panel to give us some insights. And I saw uh, Stefan from Chile has joined us already. Welcome to the panel. Hi. Okay, so uh, why don't we Okay, go thank to... you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we are, uh, as I asked, you know, we are talking about how energy efficiency progress and also new technologies. So how about, um, I start with uh, Suri first. Um, so what do you think, you know, from an energy efficiency program point of view, um, on uh, consumer appliances and technologies, you know, what, what is your view in uh, helping us, you know, to make this transition? I, I fully support uh, this idea. And then uh, in uh, Thailand, consumer organization is uh, proposed the energy democracy. Uh, first, uh, we think that the energy should be flexible uh, and uh, should be flexible and can change with the economic uh, degradation, uh, economic growth, everything that it should be flexible, the, the, the uh, principle of uh, energy democracy. The second one, I think, uh, efficiency that we were mentioned. I think it's the technology or everything that can help and then uh, to save and to uh, decrease our cost. It should be implemented uh, fairly. And the uh, third one that is the principle, it, uh, we should uh, go to the low carbon society where it which is very, very difficult, not only the carbon credit themselves, but we should uh, looking for a uh, low carbon society. And then the fourth one, uh, we should control by local community, local government, or even because it's very difficult to uh, running everything in the uh, central system. And, and that should be uh, local uh, control. And the last one, I think, Equitables and and this is can if consumer uh, try to move uh, five principles and then even the security that we are we are arguing or dilemma to us is a burden to the consumer and then uh, equitables also can be uh, helping consumer but I do agree with the efficiency that it need to be. Uh, uh, work more and more on consumer organization. Thank you, Kili. Thank you, Suri. How about Stefan from Chile? Yes. <clears throat> well, in Chile, we have a, a go, we have go through a process from a the transition process from cool driven plants to solar or wind wind plants. So it can be very successful to change the, uh, the energy matrix for a cleaner means of production. However, we still have a lot to do and mainly in, uh, in the, uh, regarding the consumer participation, consumers organization, participation in in participation in the making policy so we have been uh, called for a, a lot of uh, panels but we think that is still missing the dialogue with communities because we have here a uh, i see what i say uh, recently uh, about the uh, 40, 50% of the energy uh, is provided by the coal mine, coal source. So it's very dirty, no? And so this government and the former government have been a lot of efforts in, in terms of to close and to close the coal, the coal uh, energy plants. So uh, for, I think that uh, optimistic 200 uh, next year it will be uh, cleaner and it will be closing all the plants which uh, uh, is uh, contaminated but anyway 
consumers' organization have to be part in this uh, energy future because uh, the real access to it. Today in Chile, there are a willingness to participate in clear energy, but it requires real support from the public and private sector to integrate this without a uh, great sacrifice because we have now a, a problem, but we have a very, very, I mean, clean future. If we, there, we are optimists in what we can use our resource in a, in a soul, soul, uh, and, uh, solar and uh, and uh, and wind uh, in, in terms to of to 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 change uh, the 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 energy matrix. I think that is what to say. Thank you, Stefan. It seems like there are quite a lot of uh, actions already in uh, Chile, but hopefully, you know, yeah. we can see the results, you know, really soon. Uh, so going back to Angela and also Katie, because you are the two experts in um, uh, in energy. So for, I go to Angela first. Uh, energy efficiency and also um, technology. What do you think are the key breakthroughs? And also when we talk about um, um, the role of demand reduction. So how can we achieve that? Angela, what is your 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 insights about it? So I would rather we talked about not wasting energy than demand reduction, because not wasting energy is a goal for everybody on the planet, whereas demand reduction is really differentiates between those people who have so much energy they can waste some and those people who don't have enough energy and they need more energy to be able to do something useful with it. But I think we all share a common goal of not wasting energy. And we have to remember that today's world energy system Half the energy we produce never gets used. So we want a new energy system. We don't need, we, we're going to have to have a bigger energy system, but we want to make sure that we get rid of what's called the systemic efficiencies, inefficiencies. Now they're very different to the end user efficiency. You know, do I plug in this toaster or this toaster? What time of the day do I plug it in? What do I pay for my electricity? Can I eat less toast? Whatever, right? Those are the end user efficiencies. And there's a lot of a lot of that improvement happens through product cycles, right? But the systemic efficiencies are something very different. And Katie was hinting at these. Is You've got a challenge when you're looking at systemic, the whole system efficiency, because if you make it too lean and too efficient, it's very fragile. And then when you have a shock, then nobody has any energy. And then that's a bad problem. So you've got to balance the need for systemic efficiency. And you do that by giving more flexibility. So what we really want is, again, you're going to come back to the trilemma. You're going to have to have, we're going to have to be able to have consumers able to use their trilemma to work out their choices and bring their voices in these dialogues, but also bring their visions of what they think the future of energy looks like for them. At the moment, we've got a lot of top down roadmaps. We've got very few bottom up road builders involved in this process. And it's important that we have more people bringing their, their voices to the table, understanding their choices, the trade-offs and the benefits, and understanding what's fair around who's benefiting and how from this transition. And that's what the World Energy Council means when we say we have a humanizing energy imperative, because the future shape of energy systems is going to be user-centric but we spend 90% of the time talking about supply technologies, not user-centric services. And if we can change that conversation, I think we'll find many more opportunities for efficiency and also for less waste. Wow, I, I, I totally agree with you, Angela, because uh, um, in Hong Kong, the situation uh, a long, long time ago, we set our, uh, our uh, electricity system is a Rolls-Royce system with a lot of wastage and food time with the government measures and also trying to contain the, um, the bill, uh, we make it you know, uh, far more efficient than before. So that takes quite a bit of effort for doing it. Uh, Katie, you are another expert. So do you have any, anything you know, to supplement uh, on top of you know, what we have discussed right now? Oh, yes, yes. I think that um, uh, Angela teed it up so nicely for me in thinking about um, how important the consumer is in this transition. So with energy efficiencies, 
one of five very important pillars to the clean energy transition. We've got cleaner energy, energy efficiency, electrification, which can do overall energy efficiency, um, low carbon resources for those hard to abate sectors, and carbon capture. And so when we look at the energy efficiency pillar, um, I love this idea of not wasting ener energy, right? So if we don't want to waste it, can someone else use it? So we're trying to promote this idea of a shared energy economy. So are, is there an industrial cluster where we can share the infrastructure and maybe somebody can use somebody else's waste heat? Um, how can we, if we have water heaters in a, in a community, can we, um, um, because they, they generally can hold their heat for a while, if there's a time um, when we need it somewhere else, can we pause the electricity to those water heaters? and redirect the energy. Um, so what can we do with our infrastructure so that we're sharing more? And I think that can be a big um, bonus for energy efficiency. Okay, thank you, Katie. Before I, I open the floor for QA, <clears throat> actually today is World Consumer Rights Day. So we have to go back to consumer. Uh, we've talked about, you know, we have to listen to the voice of consumer. We have to make it consumer centric. And um, just sharing uh, one research that I did in Hong Kong about the consumer behavior, um, the awareness of uh, energy efficiency is very high. Uh, but when we talk about um, uh, uh, um, to take a concept into behavior, that requires a lot of motivation and incentive. And they are very pragmatic. They talk about if I have the incentive to do so, obviously, if it is a more difficult action, I will consider that. So the final questions before we open the floor for QA is how we can embrace consumer more into designing and also uh, uh, and engaging them, you know, in the policy design, in the dialogue of the energy transition and also the, the whole energy system, you know, how we can make it better and optimize it for, for their own market and also to the world. So this is a very important question because it consumer at the end of the day is the one that to consume the energy, right? So how we can engage them, embrace them, motivate them, and make them, you know, be, be part of us, you know, to make it to happen. Um, probably, you know, I should start with the market level first. Suri, what do you think? What what kind of alliance, you know, you want to, you believe, you know, will be useful to to build, you know, with our consumers? Uh, I. I do believe in uh, consumer uh, representation, representation in policy level decision. Uh, let's say that how, like we have friend from Korean, I remember that she's the one who are a chair who make decision that uh, which company they're gonna buy gas from which company. She, she, she's sitting as a chairman and how consumer can be in a, a policy decision as a representation. Right now, I think in uh, our plan development in every country, mostly uh, uh, government bodies sitting and, and they are uh, doing more on security than efficiency or uh, green energy's purpose. And uh, uh, I think consumer movement should uh, make collaboration with uh, environmental group. Uh, example from Thailand, we close collaboration with green, uh, with uh, environmental group who are working with uh, like river group, something like that. And, and or even to the one uh, with, uh, any civil society group where uh, specialization or even with, with uh, green air group, something that we should uh, collaboration with them to uh, make more uh, consumer power in uh, decision making or uh, uh, make a proposal to the government with evidence based uh, information. I think very important that how we submit our proposal with evidence-based uh, information. Uh, as I mentioned already uh, about the uh, security that uh, very huge and how 
we collaborated with a uh, party so so to this cut in the parliament in some sort of issue i think every every activity that we can run continuing in this uh, uh, energy movement is very important and and all the activity that we can do we can run to make sustainable on uh, energy consumption that is the uh, principle also to our consumer movement yeah thank you really thank you sorry um that was very very practical uh stefan how about uh your your market chile how how do well, you think well, you know can make uh, consumers to at the decision making level yeah, decision making level is important for for uh, uh, motivate uh, the change of patterns in uh, energy uh, consumption. Any, uh, for example, we see for encourage consumers to 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 do it. It's very important to uh, regard for the free choice. If I I want to explain. We don't have the possibility to choose our energy company in Chile. We there is it is considered as the natural monopoly. That means that you are a well, you, you can't choose. So if you can't choose, you are you I mean there are a lot of barriers for. Uh, the entrance of new actors in, I think that the concurrence between all other companies in terms to capture the consumers will be a very, very important for uh, the prices. And you know that consumers are aware of the climate change, are aware of the all the problem that the energy, but I think in the environment, and in the pocket. And if you are able to make a policy that your cost not going to, to go up, so it's uh, how, how is it pretend to do this year, it's important to have a free choice so you can choose the companies. I know experience in the, in the North Europe. You can choose company who is cleaner in the production. Uh, and but you you don't have any possibility here. So consumer movement must uh, press for this change in policy and influence policy making in terms to uh, have an open market for this uh, uh, for for a open concurrence or open competition, open market in terms that you can have a free choice, at least in one of the energy products that is a, is a, um, a what is a solar and wind, you know? So uh, we have a concrete policy to, to have influence and we, that we are, are trying to do uh, with more, uh, uh, but we have uh, been failure for, a lot of uh, years trying to change these uh, patterns, but uh, I think that uh, what it helped that it helped us is uh, the people who's more and more aware how the climate change is impact in our lives. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Okay, we are running short of time, but I, I really want to have Saruja to share with us just one example from your experience that worked best in engaging consumers in the whole dialogue. So can you give us a very, very uh, short answer for that uh, about your experience? Yeah, actually there are several. I can give one example uh, so far. And uh, when the government comes up with a tariff order, like uh, and they wake up, when they come up with a new tariff, there is a public hearing that they conduct before the tariff is finalized. So CAG actually demystifies it's very important that the consumers understand the language of a particular document early policy document that the government comes out with so when they put it out then we actually demystify the language so that it is simple for the consumers to understand and we take it to them and the, we taught the government the community to participate in the public hearing where they could voice their concerns about some aspects of the order 
and uh, and they could actually give their uh, views to the government on this so this uh, so i think it is very important that we actually the laws are demystified the policies are demystified for the layman to understand so that he can effectively participate in the decision making processes of the government yeah so then they are able to give meaningful uh, representations to the government yeah great saroja okay yeah. angela you're working at the world's level so what is your experience about it you know what works and you know, what needs has been addressed and what needs hasn't yet been addressed before we move on to uh, katie to talk about it on the government level well, let me just clarify, the World Energy Council is a deeply local, globally connected network. So we look at what, how to engage people in their different roles. They're not just consumers, they're citizens, and they're also members of communities. We have to remember that all energy transitions are place-based. So it's very, un very important that we understand what are the choices at a community level, as well as what are the choices at the market or con citizen, the consumer level, and what are the choices around the citizen level, right? We've always got those choices. So we have, we have, we have deeply um, involved processes going. In Australia, we've been running a transformathon where people have been interacting as community-led teams to understand how do they manage their energy trilemma through transition whether that's a local community, a city-based level, or a regional community. In Aberdeen, we've got an, in, an intervention where we're looking at how do we help an oil and gas city transform, transition to becoming a hydrogen and renewable energy city? And how do you engage people in their role of consumers, citizens, and community members? And that, that intervention so far shows that many of those people understand what's involved, very few of them think they're going to benefit, and that's a big issue. And then we have other, in, in places like the Middle East, we've got some interventions where we're trying to work out how do we build the new enabling ecosystem? That's a technical term, and it really means energy, energy is a system, and it's not just technologies, there are people in that system. And if you put those people together, they form an ecosystem. How do we get that ecosystem interacting with each other? So I would say we engage people in different roles at all levels of society. And we're trying to learn and help them learn with and from each other about the social energy agenda, which is so far largely missing from the debate, or as Katie said, is the last thing to be talked about when we get everything else sorted out. We want it to be the starting point for the conversation, not the end point. Oh, wonderful. Okay, Katie, you're the last one. So from your experience in the government, how do you ensure that you know everyone has been embraced and also um, to listen to the voice and, and embrace them you know, into the decision-making process? And for the audience, uh, we will open up for Q&A very soon. So please you know, have your question ready uh, so that you know, we can have all your, uh, all your insightful questions you know, to be posed to our speakers. Okay, uh, Katie. Sure. So I think of like the starting of the conversation, as Angela said. So I'll give you a, a terrific example when I was with the U.S. Department of Energy. And there was a, a project where uh, a transmission project. There were two. So one took seven years, $18 million, and didn't get built. I had another that took 18 months and got built and benefited a tribal community um, with a solar farm. And what was the difference? The difference was they told the communities before they even started. They said, hey, we're thinking about building this transmission line and what do you think? And because they engaged the community at the beginning, it was a success. And so uh, to me, that's, that makes it so incredibly real. So I'll close with that. Thank you, Gilly. Thank you so much, Katie. Okay, now we open the floor for questions. Um, I have a question from Felicia. Uh, she asked about the issue of affordability and accessibility are skewed against consumers in rural areas in many countries. So what solutions can the speakers suggest to solve or minimize this problem? Are there any research findings on the best practices that can be shared to improve affordability and accessibility in rural areas? Um, so it is from uh, Felicia from Nigeria. So who want to give it a try? Um, Suraja, do you want to give it a try? Rural areas. I can answer. I can give. Oh, I can give it. Okay. okay. 
I was a few years ago, I was in conversation with a, an African minister and he was trying to solve a problem. And his problem was they had taken the World Bank loans and they had installed the cheapest, cleanest energy system in their country. Right. This is microgrid, solar powered microgrids. And he had a default on payments. So how in a largely rural context had they put in the cheapest greenest energy system, which was supposed to give them affordability and sustainability? And how did they end up with people not being able to pay or not being willing to pay for the energy provided? So I asked him, I said, when you started off and you asked them what they needed energy for, what did they say? And he said, we never asked that question. Oh, OK. Wow, my goodness. All right. So Katie or, or, or Stefan or, or Sari, do you have any um, uh, experience you know, to share with Felicia as well about uh, rural areas? Not in my case, no. Not in your case. OK. All right. Then um, probably, you know, we move on to the next questions is about uh, Apuva from uh, from India as well. Uh, it's talking about um, uh, uh, also about the uh, efficient and economical energy distribution in village area, that solar panel. So please share with them, you know, about uh, possible uh, proper management system for distribution for poor people. Um, any experience or learnings or observations, you know, from different markets that you can share with uh, Apuva in this uh, in this uh, panel discussion? Uh, may maybe I start first. Uh, with the uh, solar panel, uh, when we do a, a, a solar fund foundation at the beginning, uh, we start with the, uh, the three dimension. First one is solar hospitals. Uh, we try to helping uh, a, a hospital, which is uh, mostly a government hospital, to to do a solar panel in in like in public uh, uh, office, and especially run by the uh, hospitals. And I, we found that uh, seven hospital that we are running now improving significant from thirty kilowatt that we started to more than some of them uh, reach one megawatt uh, to do a solar panel in, in public hospital. And then the second uh, phase we run on, on the solar, uh, solar school. And we use a technical school to be uh, like a hub of the uh, community to support community themselves also to promote for solar energies. And then the third part that they are coming soon is a solar committee that we are campaign on one on million uh, rooftop and million solar panels uh, initiative. And we propose to the uh, politician for general election to uh, come up with significant uh, moving to uh, green energy more and more, especially I, do, I, I, I will support Angela also in the sense that if in each country you have to uh, like doing some index, how we move forward to green energies or sustainable energies. And then if we doing lower and then it's be more, uh, the government would like to do more uh, higher and higher and higher and support that. I think that will be also the, the uh, possibility and collaboration with also with the business sector to uh, promote uh, solar energy. Yes, that is experience from Thailand on solar energy. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. So we, for the last seven or eight years, we've been running the Startup Energy Transition Awards with the German Development Agency. And you'll find, if, if you go and look at that, you'll find there's plenty of examples of how social entrepreneurs are getting into energy transition and combining data um, with energy, energy instrument, instruments in rural uh, villages 
so that they're learning about how the community is using the energy and therefore how best to share it so that there's the greatest value generated. So there's very new micro business models that are coming out, which are about digitalization and decarbonization at the same time. And there's hundreds of examples of those if you look at the Startup Energy Transition uh, Program. Wonderful. I think it will be a very good resource. Stefan? No, it's a very important question because the, the, the connection between, uh, uh, for example, uh, solar energy and, uh, and, um, and the price, energy price is very important. As I said before, uh, we, we have a lot of soul here and it's a lot of uh, improving, uh, investing in uh, solar plants. But the question is, is still very expensive for domestic use. Is it still very expensive to, uh, for a normal house, have a solar panel? So the, this, the, the government official has to subside, subside, support, let's say so. But is, uh, is it very, is it still uh, not enough? We have very uh, a lot of uh, the possibility to have solar energy, and it have not only the poor part of the population and all the population, but it's still too uh, too uh, expensive. And uh, if we not if we don't are able as a country to subsidize to support the transition in the domestic energy i think that we are going to go around uh, over and over for for years because because uh, it's a it's a question i would say uh, before if say uh, how you can break the barrier for uh, the competitions and you have new companies who can offer solar energy but you don't have now the possibility to choice and it's still very expensive, which is a very unfortunate situation. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we are time flies, you know, we are getting a little bit close to the end of this session. Uh, I think, you know, with uh, the dialogue of today uh, at the World Consumer Rights Day, um, uh, we are talking about in order to have a global energy transition, we need to have a very good government policies. We need uh, good subsidies or schemes initiative to support um, the um, the whole market. You know, for this development, we need proper and uh, responsible uh, business attitude uh, to support the development, and also consumer involvement and motivation um, to make them you know to embrace to embrace them you know in the in the participation. So um, before we get to the close, I think you know I would like to invite all our panel speakers to make a um, final remark in 30 seconds uh, because it's a global uh, agenda so uh, it will be have a, it will be a dialogue in the COP28 very soon in uh, you uh, that will be held in the UAE at the end of this year so what do you want to see at this important conference to advance you know this agenda who want to start first Katie how about you sure I'd like to think about the whole picture, to see holistically, and that means including the consumer, starting with the consumer, talking early. I think if we can do that, that will be the key to the success of the transition. Great. Stefan, you want to go the second? What do you want to see in COP28? Consumer organization to make test a product, test product have to take uh, uh, have in mind also who, uh, which energy this product have uh, been used. I mean, consumer organization uh, is uh, still uh, more oriented to price, price and quality. So price and quality have to be a, a, a very big, a, a, an important issue in uh, testing. But we have to slowly, slowly put in our the, the energy, how energy, how, how much energy has been used for this product. So we have the three test uh, model and the, I think that uh, we have to move in this way. 
Thank you, Stefan. Um, Sorry, what do you think on COP28? Uh, I think, yep, uh, I think energy is, is centers of other issues like uh, public uh, utility transportation and for COP, uh, uh, I think we should uh, moving to uh, decreasing uh, uh, net zeros uh, 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 priorities and, and all consumer organization should also uh, working actively to make uh, transitions on uh, green energies and empower consumer to to uh, validate uh, the uh, the data uh, at even at uh, local communities and don't let greater working alone consumer organization have uh, to work on this uh, transition and actively on moving to uh, sustainable on energy consumption I think thank you. Thank you. Saroja, and then final one is Angela. Saroja, what do you think? COP28. Yeah, thank you, Gilly. So I think uh, we need to actually continue to focus on decarbonization, which is the primary focus, and climate, uh, which is the major concern today. And so we need to work towards moving towards, uh, towards greener energy. But I have one suggestion even for the longer term, one thing that we need to think about, start thinking today itself is about the disposal of these solar panels. The storage technologies need to be improved on the one hand, and we are talking about batteries and storage, but then disposal of these batteries are also a concern and should not land up being a burden on the environment and health. So this is also something I think we need to have these parallel conversations as well and a holistic approach should be there. Yeah, thank you. Great, Saruja. Angela, you have the final remark. So I'd like to start by saying I share His Excellency Dr. Sultan Al Jabba's ambition that this is a COP for all, right? I think that's the most important. COP28 has to be the COP for all. From our perspective, there's two other things we would add is we went into COP26 with everybody wanting to be a net zero hero. We want everybody to come out of COP28 being an energy trilemma titan, right? Everybody being able to manage security, affordability, and um, sustainability choices. And the other bit is I'd like to see a little less um, hubris, a little more hope, humility, and hard work. This transition is going to take hundreds of thousands of smaller steps by place-based communities. And I would like to start showcasing and celebrating these steps that are already happening across very diverse rural, urban regions and communities. Because if seeing is believing, and if we keep telling everybody it's not working, people will give up hope. Thank you, Angela. Uh, I think, you know, we have a very, very meaningful day today for the World's Consumers' Rights Day with a distinguished you know, panel of speakers to talk about a very big uh, agenda for the world is uh, energy transition. And um, thank you so much for all the panelists. But before we close, let me help CI to make some uh, uh, advertisement about the next two days, because tomorrow we will have exploring consumer centric solutions for clean energy assets. And on Friday, we have this, we will discuss about how consumer policy can be updated to meet energy transitions goals. These are also two exciting topics and very important topics, you know, for us to listen to and also to take part on it. So hopefully, you know, everyone of you will be able to spare time um, to join this. And um, uh, for that, uh, we have a wonderful celebration today. And thank you so much again for all the distinguished speakers. And um, also, you know, one final thing is I saw Rafael uh, have a proposal to propose that consumer advocacy groups start campaigning and canvassing for the adoption and implementation of participatory project management strategies to encompass the active involvement of consumers in energy projects in their countries. So he asked us, you know, what do you think? Uh, probably because of uh, the time, we may not be able to discuss it together, but I'm sure this idea, this idea will be a very good thought for all of us in uh, working us together um, to make the world, you know, to have a proper energy transitions and, and keep our environment much cleaner uh, than before. 
So for that, I thank everyone for it. And um, we will close, you know, we have, uh, uh, for the close you know, of this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Happy celebration. Bye-bye.